a lot of you probably grew up playing licks, kind of like the first one. Lots of bends, lots of vibrato. What you need to get that is your thumb over the top of the neck to act as an anchor. Without that anchor, it's hard to get a good aggressive vibrato or bend. Um, this is uh, in the style of players like, you know, Jimi Hendrix and uh, Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Eddie Van Halen, and things like that. But then, uh, every now and then, you see licks. They have a lot of legato, a lot of um, stretches, and lots of left hand pyrotechnics, if you will. And, uh, those are a little harder players like uh, Joe Cetriani, Steve Vai, uh, and the such that uh, they play a lot of those licks, but they also play a lot of those blues licks. And the way they can do it is they use two positions. They use that first position where the thumb is over the top of the neck. Then they use another one to where the thumb is behind the neck and it frees up the left hand fingers to do things that it couldn't do. So, what we're going to focus on today is that second position to where the thumb is behind the neck and you have complete access to all these legato and uh, stretch and left hand movements that you don't have access to with the thumb over the top of the neck. So the first thing you need to do is find a uh, position. But before we find a position, we have to discover uh, how our hand works in general. So here's my wrist. Here's a fist. Here's the, the fist is the uh, most powerful and the strongest position I can make. Um, notice how straight my wrist is. If I bend my wrist and try to make the fist, well I can't really make a fist. It doesn't work. Same thing for stretching out my hand. I stretch out all my fingers as far as I can go. I have to do it with a kind of a straighter wrist. If I bend my wrist, I can't get very far. So the wrist position in between the fist and the stretch is really all you need to play the guitar. You do any further than that, well, you're just doing yourself the damage and you could hurt yourself or you're just making life harder on yourself. So remember that as we go through to the next item, which is establishing a left hand position, uh, a general left hand position for all this stuff. So one thing you need is a uh, bottle or a mug or thermos or something like that. I want you to grab it and hold on to it. One thing you'll notice is the thumb is behind the second finger. This is to keep a secure grip on the item I have here. If the thumb was by my first finger, we'd want to push the, the bottle this way. If it was behind my fourth finger, it would tilt it this direction. But by keeping the thumb in the middle of the hand, it gives a good counterbalance to the force of the fingers which is nice to have when you play the guitar. So if you have that position, that C, what you want to do is flatten the thumb out a little bit so when it presses on the back of the guitar, it's not tense, but you're using the biggest thumb muscle to help support that way. So you have this flat C kind of shape. The last thing you want is all these fingers to be in a line. Notice uh, they're bent and curved at such a rate that I can line all of them up on my finger or a string if I wanted to, which we'll do next. For the next part, you don't even need your guitar turned up or anything. You just need to have the guitar um, in a position to where your wrist is straight and you can take that flat C to um, one string. Notice I have my fingers lined up on this one string starting on the fifth fret, one finger per fret. This is a good position. Also, notice um, each finger is right behind a fret. I'm not in no man's land in between the fourth and the fifth fret or uh, with any of the other fingers. I'm right next to the fret. Now, you don't want to get too close to the fret, but you just want to sit right behind it where you can barely see the silver fret sticking out of the other end of your finger, like that. It's important to get that right there on the fret 
because if you move um, away from the fret, it takes more energy and more pressure to push the string down. The more pressure it takes to push the string down, the strings could go out of tune, they could go sharp. But if you put just enough pressure right next to the fret, you can use very little pressure and still securely press the string down and get the note out. So with the correct fret position in mind, go ahead and put your fingers, one finger per fret, on the high E string on the fifth fret, then move to the next string. See if you can hold that position. As you move to lower frets, closer to the nut, it begins harder to maintain that position. It's because the frets are further and further apart. If you can maintain all the way down to the first fret, that's good. Now you can work going down scale, higher on the neck, to where the frets get closer and closer. If you move all the way down to you know the 17th fret, it begins to be difficult to keep your fingers that close together. So you need to actually work on compressing the fingers to achieve this kind of position. Next, you may decide to take it a step further. So what we want to do is we want to take the whole position and just move it up and down on one string. Kind of like you're uh, scratching. Then move it to the next string. If any time the scratching gets your fingers out of position, reset the position and then start again and see how long you can keep that exact position. Detail is everything. You want to be exactly behind that fret. Once again, be sure and practice this. All the way down to the first fret, and as high up on the guitar as you can manage. Next, what you want to try is to move the left hand fingers in a group to adjacent strings back and forth. So here I'm going between the E and the B string paying very close attention to the position. Now the B and the G, G and the D, D and the A, and the A and the E. The next thing you want to try is take just one finger, move it to adjacent strings. So here the first finger is going to adjacent strings. Try with the second finger. The third finger is quite difficult, which will bring up a point. If you put all your fingers down on a flat surface like a chair or a table or something like that, you try to lift each finger individually. You'll find it's pretty easily done, and you can do it with a lot of freedom of motion and strength until you get to the third finger. To get any energy from this finger, you need to be moving the right muscles and the right joint. It's impossible to move that third finger from the smallest joint on your finger. There's just not an independent tendon or a piece of muscle that'll move that finger like that. What you have to focus on is keeping the curvature in the finger steady and just moving the big knuckle and then the second to largest knuckle of that third finger. If you focus on those two, you'll have a lot of more success moving that third finger. So the pinky isn't that hard to move on its own. It has its own uh, muscle on the side of your hand here. And if you work it out quite a lot, you can even feel it get a little tense or hard at times. It's a good spot to massage your hand if you ever feel your uh, pinky getting a little tense. Next, we can try to move pairs of fingers. Here's the first and second finger moving. Notice I can move to an adjacent string up or down. Here's the uh, second and uh, third finger. That one's a little harder. Here's the third and the fourth. And notice I'm not putting a lot of pressure when I uh, do this exercise. I'm, I'm just 
trying to maintain contact with the string as I uh, move the individual fingers or pairs of fingers. So if we move uh, three fingers and just leave one standing, you get this thing to where you feel like you're pivoting around that one finger. That first finger just pivots as the other three fingers do the work. Here's over the pinky pivoting. Yeah, see, that one's pretty tough. Or if you have the third finger, that can get very difficult. It really wants to move with the other fingers if you let it. This is a really good one. You may want to double anything that gives your third finger uh, trouble. Do it twice as much. And finally, what we can do is we can uh, move just one finger all the way up and down the neck like this. Not to do just adjacent strings, but all the way through all the strings. You can be creative and come up with other exercises that are like this. The whole idea is having control of individual digits. This is the beginning of a concept called finger independence. That'll really give your left hand a new gear that you didn't even know you had. You'll be able to access a lot more energy and move the energy in a lot more efficient ways. So uh, another exercise with all this is uh, using stretches. So uh, maybe we can reach between our first and second finger and do all the same things that we just did. So here's uh, the exercise where we move the whole, the whole position back and forth between adjacent strings. Or maybe we just move one finger. As you see, you can be very creative. The trick is you want to find the things you're bad at and work on those a whole, whole bunch. Just double up the work on those bad things like moving your third finger by itself. Another thing you can do besides your first and second finger is try to stretch between your third and fourth finger. This can lead to a lot of issues with that third finger independence. But you can work them out if you try. It just takes time and patience. You can always get better. There's plenty of room. I start with this kind of practice every day. It really uh, opens up your mind the way your finger moves and your natural uh, hand anatomy and how it works. Finally, you could do a stretch between your first and second and third and fourth finger and move individu individual digits around. Once again, just be creative and find different ways that you can uh, Manipulate individual finger movements and a group movement in one position across the strings, up and down the neck. This will really get you a feel for the kind of position that you need to play those big legato licks that just seem to last forever. So uh, you need a way to test out uh, the position work that you're doing. One thing I like to do is I use uh, three patterns. I use this legato uh, exercise where I go to the first finger, second finger, fourth finger, back to the second finger, and then restart the pattern over again. If you do this in repetition, you get something like this. And if you uh, can do that pretty effortlessly, you're probably in a good position uh, with your independence in those fingers. You try the same thing, but maybe with one, three, and four. You find that you can do it as good. Work a little bit more on the exercises that challenge your third finger. Uh, you can try it with uh, one, two, and four with a stretch in between one and two. Use these as references. This will tell you how much progress you gain with your basic finger independence and maintaining that uh, new position that will give you extra linear speed. In this video, 
We'll look at some exercises that'll help strengthen the left hand fingers and continue to build finger independence and coordination. The first exercise, we're gonna start just like the uh, first video in this series about building position. So we have this uh, C shape, this flattened C shape on the fifth fret, one finger per fret. What we're gonna do with the, these fingers planted, we're gonna take the first finger, we're gonna make a trill between the open string and the fifth fret on the B string. The trick is to keep the other fingers very still. Make sure they don't bend the string. Take the second finger, do the same thing. Want the uh, the hammer on and the pull to be quite strong. Then the third finger. It's a little little more difficult. Third or the fourth finger. You can do that. Go to the uh, next string. Continue on down the fretboard. Uh, what you'll notice is uh, it actually gets easier on the thicker strings because they tend to uh, tend to respond better to hammer-ons and pull-offs uh, than the uh, skinnier uh, treble strings do. One thing, a uh, piece of advice, if, if you have trouble with this exercise, what you can do is you can just move the finger, like the third finger especially, in the path that it needs to move but without pressing the string all the way down, just kind of scratching the string and getting used to feeling some kind of range of motion that's independent with that third finger that doesn't jostle around the second and the fourth finger with it. Kind of like that. Then as the motion gets more confident and you tap into the right muscle, you can add a little strength. So you can try that exercise uh, all up and down the neck in different positions and uh, be sure to work that third finger uh, double or triple time than you would the others because it's a lot more stubborn and uh, it takes more work to get third finger independence. The next exercises we'll look at will be uh, what I call trills with held notes. This exercise which you'll need to start, as you can see in the example below, is the uh, power chord shape between the first and the third finger and it goes like this so what we have going here is really two things at the same time between the first and the second finger we have between the third and the fourth finger we have two together, you get a difficult exercise, one that builds lots of finger independence and strength. Notice how even my hammer on and the pull off is. To get to achieve that sound, you want a strong downward force on your hammer on. And for your pull off, you actually want to move the finger away towards the floor, like you're plucking the note that's held below it. A variation on that exercise is you can use the pinky as the chilling note. It's important when you do these exercises to keep the fingers very still and not bending the strings or other fingers moving when other fingers are supposed to be moving. The focus here is the finger independence and the clarity of the trills and the evenness of the rhythm. A variation is you can swap the fingers so all the fingers that were on the low string are now on the high string and vice versa. And you get an exercise that looks like this one. this one. It's very 
difficult to keep the third finger still while the fourth finger is pulling off and the pinky still while the third finger is pulling off. It's also difficult to keep the pinky from accidentally hitting a higher string and muting it, like this. See, I muted the top note. So you have to be careful when you pull off that you miss that higher string just by a little bit. Let's look at some more of these trills with held notes. So for the next set, start with your um, first and second finger with a tritone shape, like in the example. And the third finger will play on the low string, and the fourth finger will end up playing on the higher string. The, this example is shown below, sounds like this. It's not a race to see if you can play it fast. When people think of a trill, they often think it's something that's fast, but I'm just thinking it as being repetitive. You could also do that example with the pinky trilling like this. switch this position and rotate the fingers. So now the first and the second switch and the third and the fourth switch. Then you get an exercise that looks like this. Or one like this. Finally, we can group the uh, second and third finger on the high string and the first and fourth on the low string and get a uh, exercise that looks like this. Or like this. Be sure and try these on uh, higher strings as well as they're more difficult to keep the evenness in the rhythm and the articulate nature of the pull off and the hammer on even. Also note that they get more difficult the lower in position that you get or the closer to the nut rather. If you're having trouble with them, uh, do them like you did on the last exercise. Maybe just kind of scratch the string, establish a path of motion, or some finger independence first. It works, all works in order. You have to establish position, then feel the finger independence, then eventually the strength comes in the finger independence and you gain more coordination. They always have to work in that order. So those are trills with held notes. Those will give you a lot of um, finger independence and strength if you work on them, and they'll help your scale speed probably more than any exercise I know. Next set of exercises will be what I call mirror exercises. Let's start in the uh, position shown below. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start here, and now we're gonna switch the second and third finger. Now switch the first and the fourth finger, and now the second and third finger, and the first and the fourth finger. This puts us back where we started. So once again, as you switch the fingers, try to leave the ones that you're not switching uh, down so the note sustains through. Try these on other uh, four sets of adjacent strings. And be sure to work down to lower positions. This is really 
good for that uh, balance aspect of the hand position. As you switch through these uh, positions, avoid the temptation to move your hand position. Try to keep it nice and square and let the fingers do all the work. A variation on that exercise is to do the same uh, movements but play each note one at a time like this. Very difficult thing to keep uh, each note separated too. To make it even harder, what you can do is you can uh, do the same exercise but uh, skip some strings in the uh, pattern like this. Notice to perform that I have to use my fingers my right hand because I wouldn't have enough to really control by using a pick and the fingers like in a hybrid pick situation. Remember that's not the important point. The point is that we're working the left hand and focusing on the finger independence and control of that. So another exercise uh, that I just can't get enough of is just working on basic slur patterns um, on one string and then moving to the next string. Uh, here's an example. Notice I repeated the uh, third to fourth finger twice on each string. That's because uh, that's the finger pair that tends to need more work and more practice. You could also do the same thing with pull-offs. key here is, is to get evenness in all these slur exercises between the pick notes and the slurred notes. You want them to have the same volume and have it to where they don't affect the rhythm and the flow of the exercise. These would be good to practice with a metronome. Here's a couple more. In the previous two, we mixed pull-off, hammer-on, and pick notes. That made it even harder to even out the, uh, the rhythm and the uh, volume of each note, but that's the most important part. In today's video, we're going to discover exercises for the reach and applications for uh, stretch in your left hand. The first thing uh, you need to do is understand that uh, reaching and stretching is not necessarily the most natural movement, so you may need to warm up. What I like to do is just to gently um, pull my left hand fingers back with my right hand Definitely not to the point of any kind of discomfort, but just a good stretch and hold it for a little bit. Then also come the other direction. This will get your muscles good and warmed up and can help prevent injury. Always listen to your body. If you feel any uncomfortableness during these exercises, stop, especially any sharp pains. Sharp pains are the worst. That means stop what you're doing and put your guitar down. First exercise I want to look at is um, one that uh, we've kind of already seen before. It at least starts in a familiar position. So what we're going to do is we're going to start in this position below, and we're going to move one finger at a time in this position. First the first finger, then the second finger, 
the third finger, and then the fourth finger. And now we're down a fret from where we started, and we can continue. Each time you move down a fret, it gets a little harder than the time before. You can also try this on uh, other sets of adjacent strings. Another thing you can try is you can use the mirror shapes that we learned in the last video and uh, do the same exercise. So we'll start with the third and the second finger switched and now move one finger at a time. Or we can start in this position. finally, like this. There's actually some usable chords in there. So uh, take your time and maybe analyze each one of those shapes for the uh, possible harmonies and chords they can make. Another uh, variation of this exercise uh, this is kind of for your extreme pro kind of stretchers out there. Don't put yourself in a stretcher with this exercise. There we ended up with a stretch between all four fingers. So uh, they, may, they may be one that uh, you're not ready for, but uh, just work up to it and don't force anything and you'll get there sooner than not. Um, the next shape I want to look at is um, a slur exercise that um, uses all the fingers and expands throughout the example. The first one goes like this. <laughs> Uh, when I got to the fourth finger, I kept reaching and stretching as far as I could. I went six frets. I could probably go a little further. But notice it was we went to the fourth finger, and then I did all the stretching. Next exercise is similar, but this time you're going to take the third finger as far as it can go before the fourth finger joins in. try moving the second finger as far as it can go before the third and the fourth finger join. Practice these on all the strings and as many positions as you can. Remember as you move down in position um, it gets more and more difficult and even you may find uh, some difficulty that the uh, horn of the uh, cutaway gets in the way with your wrist, so it may take a little work depending on what guitar you're playing. Another good exercise um, to use is coming up with um, kind of weird chord shapes, and the best way I like to come up with these is I pick a scale or a key, like the key of C. It's very familiar. If you're not familiar with the key of C on guitar, you should do that. So it's really good uh, to familiarize yourself. And what I do is I pick a uh, pattern of intervals. So for instance, if I start on this note right here, that's an F. I say, well, I'm going to go up a third. And then from the next note, go up a fourth. Then from the next note, go up a second. 
Let me get this chord shape. And in this case, you could say it would be a, a D minor 9 or maybe a, a F add, F major 7 add 6, depending how you want to look at it. But whatever it is, it's just this shape. It has that pattern of intervals of a third, then a fourth, and then a second. So if I move down one scale tone, I can go a third, a fourth, and then a second. Down to the next note in the scale, I can move a third, a fourth, and a second. Notice these intervals are diatonic. That means you can just go up in the letter names in the key that they belong to. So in the next example, if I go up a third from C, I can count C, D, E. Go up a fourth from E, E, F, G, A. And then up a second from A is a B. And the same thing on the next, the next note there. And then the same on the next. This one right here, starting from the G, is difficult because you have to reach pretty far for that first fret. And then finally, get an easy one with the open string. Let's do another one of these examples. Let's use a different pattern. Well, we'll start from the same note, the F. This time let's go up a fifth, and then a third, and then a second in the scale. So notice uh, another way to think about these uh, shapes is you can just think about each note as it belongs to the scale. So if you know the, the scale really well on one string, you can just go down to the next note on that string and find the chord that way. If you think about four strings at the same time. Or you can think about it as simply just the pattern of the intervals and the spelling of the chord and just planing that chord up and down the neck. Some more useful chord shapes that you may see uh, more common in popular music involve uh, some stretches as well. One of these is this um, A minor uh, 9 bar chord shape. Normally we play this uh, chord like this. But we can bar this chord too in other positions, like this. This is a really useful chord. It adds a lot of color. It takes away a lot of the blandness of just a regular A minor bar chord. You can also do this with the uh, E minor shape. So also, uh, you can add a 2 to the major versions of these chords. are very useful. They help spice up um, kind of common old progressions that you may have and give a little bit of lift to them. Another way to stretch uh, a chord out is taking a regular E bar chord for instance, played it up in 10th position on the D, and moving the bar down but leaving the other notes. It's a nice sound as well or maybe even move it another fret down. Those are great sounds. You can also do the same thing with an A bar chord shape. Always practice these in the higher positions first and then you can move them down to the lower number of fresh positions. So that's it for uh, stretching. Uh, one thing you want to always do is listen to your body. Don't move any further 
then your fingers tell you you can. Think of um, other ways in your mind of mapping out the stretch. One way you may think about a stretch is as a reach. So for instance, if you're trying to reach a gap between your first and second finger, instead of thinking about making the space between your first and second finger, as the second finger moving further away from the first finger, think about the space being created as the first finger reaching further away from the second finger. This will help you uh, more correctly map your body movements and uh, help prevent injury and maximize your reach potential. You've probably all played or seen an exercise like this on the guitar. You've probably all learned it. And it's a really valuable exercise for several reasons. One of the things is uh, you don't want to rush through this exercise, but you really want to listen to every note. You want to be sure that each one is connected and they're not separated. But connected. This ensures a maximum amount of uh, security in the technique because you have to line up the uh, left and the right hand at exactly the same time. There's no cheating. The other uh, thing about this exercise that most people don't take advantage of is it's just one of many permutations that you can go through and work. Let's look at the table. This is the table of permutations. Notice you can start with the one we just did, one, two, three, then four, and then you can rotate that example the two, three, four, and one. And then three, four, one, and two. And next, four, one, two, and three. So what if instead of starting with one, two, three, four, if we went one, two, four, three, then we could have rotations of it as well. Or instead of starting with one and two, we could start with one, three, two, four, get those rotations, then one, three, four, two, or perhaps we can go one, four, two, three in its rotations, or one, four, three, two. So these are the different ways that you want to um, work on all the exercises I'm about to show you. And uh, try to find a new one every day that you feel less and less comfortable with. Uh, and try to make it as strong as the ones you feel comfortable with, like one, two, three, four. Uh, let me demonstrate uh, a way you can rotate. So instead of one, two, three, four, here would be uh, two, three, four, one. You only want to play as fast as you know you can make zero mistakes and keep that legato ness or smoothness in between the notes. Here would be uh, three, four, one, two. And I could show you four, one, two, three, but I think you uh, get the drill by now. The next variation on this exercise uh, requires quite a bit of thought and uh, thinking at first that uh, feels like it's um, quite quick and sudden, but eventually your fingers will learn the pattern and be able to pick up on it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to rotate one of these tables and uh, every time we change a string, we move forward in the rotation. So the first string will be one, two, three, four. And the next one will be two, three, four, one. And then three, four, one, two. So that's just uh, one uh, permutation, permutation of the exercise. So what you want to do is go through the whole table and uh, see if you can keep up with each one and start on a different and rotate it into the next one. The next concept 
illustrates an angular approach. So all the previous exercises use uh, playing on one string at a time. That made them very linear. In this exercise, we're going to um, basically play in shapes. So the uh, angles in the, st the string spacing with the fingers. So the first example would be like if we use the combination one, two, three, four. We start with one, and then play two, one, and three, two, one, and four, three, two, one. And continue with four, three, two, one. And then the shape kind of falls off the fret. Once again. This exercise may feel very strange at first, but it's important that you practice it enough to eventually see the pattern, eventually see how that whole exercise really translates just to the pattern one, two, three, four. In contrast, here would be one uh, with four, three, two, one. So we'll start with a four, then three, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So once again, it's important to see how all that is just four, three, two, one. And you can use any of these exercises and uh, or on the table, any of the combinations on the table and write them out for yourself. It, sometimes it helps to actually write them out on a piece of paper and practice them. It's hard just to think about them out of the top of your head, but eventually they'll become very clear and you will be able to do them out of the top of your head. So one thing you can do to make the uh, difficulty of these exercises a little more difficult is you could add stretches in between the fingers. Here's an example. So instead of playing just one, two, three, four, try a one, two, three, four with a stretch between your first and second finger. And so on. Or maybe uh, try one with a stretch between your uh, third and fourth finger. Or a stretch between your first and second and your third and fourth. Or a stretch between all the fingers. Remember, the bigger the stretch, the more important it is to release the pressure from the thumb from the back of the neck. This will help the fingers stretch all the way out as easily as they can. Next exercises will feature some uh, patterns that you need to be familiar with. This first example is one that you'll see a lot when you see uh, more scale patterns, especially three note string scale patterns. But it's good to exercise it as a uh, just a finger exercise before you actually get to the actual scale pattern. The next one is a similar pattern using uh, one, three, and four. Also an alternate fingering for that one instead of using the first, third, and fourth fingers is you can use that stretch and use the uh, first, second, and third finger. The 
The next exercise uh, features a uh, position that you have to switch between the patterns. So we'll be switching between one, two to four to one, three to four. So the next example uses the uh, one, three, four pattern, but we're gonna shift down a fret every time we move to a new string like this. so forth. Also you can try this uh, with one, two, and four. And uh, you can continue to do that and diagonally zigzag across the fretboard. The next one uses a, uh, a shift that involves some squeezing and then stretching out of the shift. So we're going to start with a pattern that starts with one, three, and four. Shift up a fret and go to one, two, and four. So just between those two strings, we have a movement. We have to shift and squeeze in to the next position, and then stretch back out to the new position, and squeeze back in. So it's just a manner of squeezing and stretching. The trick is, is to make the notes as legato and connected as possible, and to not make the shifts to where your whole hand jumps. But you want the finger that's going to play on the new string to be ready while the old one is still ringing. So the first finger's ready. And it's ready again. Squeezes and ready again. That's the only way to work it out to where it stays perfectly smooth. The next exercises are kind of some bonus material. They involve playing a chromatic scale in fifths and octaves. Let's look at these chromatic fifths. This exercise will generate a lot of finger independence and um, positional stability in your uh, technique. The one thing to remember is if a note's played on the first fret, it needs to be played with the first finger. And likewise on the second fret with the second finger and third and the fourth finger. If you remember this, you'll be able to remember the exercise a little easier. Here's a chromatic fifths. It's not important that you learn the whole exercise. Take it in chunks of one or two notes, or maybe two or three notes. So start with uh, the E uh, in the fifth, and go to the F. And every time, look ahead. Be sure that the fingers that are about to play are in position to play. F to F sharp. Try to conserve as much movement as you can, and keep the fingers as close to the strings as possible. Alternately to chromatic fifths, you can do chromatic octaves like this. smoothness in the notes and the transitions. You want to be very legato. What you don't want is a lot of disconnect between the notes. So you're not really working anything. You're just jumping into position. It's like cheating. If you let the notes ring out, your fingers have to do a lot of work 
a lot of moving during the sound. You have to think ahead. notes or three notes at a time. Once they feel comfortable with the next three. 